Hello YouTube, today we're going to be talking about the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test. This is a non paired, non parametric test, and uh, I guess the conditions in which you would use this test, you must make sure that the sample is random and that the observations within each sample are independent, as well as the samples they are independent from one another. So that one thing might not indirectly cause another. Um, but let's just jump into an example. So if you're given this data on, say, growth and gap, probably with something to do with cells, um, and you wanted to test, um, a, do a hypothesis test, you would say, oh, I think that the, there's the same distribution, that's kind of like the null hypothesis, but you say, no, um, I don't think it's the same, there is a difference. Um, so you're saying, like, the mean is, this, is the same for the null, and the mean is not the same. Uh, for the alternative is kind of one analogy of doing that. So what you're going to do, this in red, that's the Wilcox and Man Whitney test formula, I guess. And what you're going to do with this data, um, pretty much you look at each point and you compare it to the um, other points relative to it. For example, oh, real quick, uh, say you want to do a 95% confidence interval, then your alpha would be 0.05. Um, so you would say how many, what, how many number of terms are less than each one. So if we look at 17, notice how, um, the, how many terms are less than 17 in terms of the gap. So 22 is larger, 29 is larger, 13 is less, 16 is less, 15 is less, 18 is larger, 14 is less, and 6 is less. So that's 5 that were less than 17. Then you do the same thing with 20. You look at which were less. 22 is higher, 29 is higher. So 13 is less, 16 is less, 15 is less, 18 is less, 14 is less, and 6 is less. So that's 6, that's one extra. And you do that all the way down, and you would say, okay, there are 170 that are less, or excuse me, 8 that are less, 8 that are less. Oh, okay. So where'd that 0.5 come from? Pretty much it means that if you have the same number, you count it as a half. So notice how the first one is 22, and you're comparing it to 22. Since they're the same, you say, okay, that's half. Um, you just kind of count it as half rather than nothing or something. Um, so again, 22 is equal to 22, so that's one half. And then 13 is less, 16 is less, 15 is less, 18 is less, 14 is less, and 6 is less. Um, and then all the other ones, they're all greater. Now you might be noticing, like, well, why isn't there another term for the growth? Like, should there be a point there? I'll address that later, but it doesn't have to be there. Um, so then you do the same thing with the other side. Now you're going in reverse, so you're looking at 22 and comparing it to 17, 20, 170, 315, 22, 190, and 64. You find out that 2.5, remember, since 22 equals 22, that counts as a half, are less than, 2.5 terms are less than 22. And for 29, there are three terms that are less than 22, and the rest are pretty much zero, except for this one, because uh, there is 17 that is less than 18, and the others are zero as well. So, what are we technically doing here? Well, note that this is the relative position that matters. We're just comparing, like, is it greater or less than, but not how much is it greater or less. So, which is kind of like, unlike the t-test, which actually uses the actual values, we are actually just looking here and saying, like, look, this one's just bigger or smaller. Um, so, obviously, a million is greater than one. Um, excuse me. Yeah, a million is greater than one, but um, 99 thousands much closer than it is to, you know what I mean? So it's like, it just, the relative position, just greater than or less than. So now, um, these terms, these columns we made, say this first column we said is K1, and all you're going to do is you're going to sum up all the terms there, so 5 plus 6 plus 8 plus 6.5 plus 8 plus 8, and that is 49.5. And we do the same thing with the second column we made, we'll call that our K2, and you add all those digits up and you get 6.5. Now the formula for the Wilcox and Man Whitney test um, is up above in the top right corner. Um, that's a U statistic, that's what the U.S. stands for, and it's pretty much the maximum value of either the K1 or the K2. So you just look at your K1 and K2 and say which one's bigger. Obviously 49.5 is bigger, um, so that will be your um, U.S. statistic that you'll look in a table, but in order to read this table, which I'll show in a moment, you need to have a few other pieces of information. Note the sample size. So, pretty much the sample size here is the larger n, so notice how the left column here for growth has only 7, um, and the gap has 8, so that means our large sample size is 8, um, and our n prime, which is the smaller one, would be 7. So you can actually look that up in this table here. Um, it might be kind of blurry, but um, on the left is n, and then on 
Next to that is n prime. So I highlighted 8 because we had 8 for our n and then 7 for our n prime. And then we had our u statistics we calculated to be 49.5. If you notice, it was the bigger k1 value. So we look at that and you say, okay, well, there's a 48 and a 50, so our 49.5 lies between these two values. Now I'll write down the values here. That's kind of what was written in bold with a 49.50, and those were the two values. Now that we go back to our 95% uh, confidence interval with an alpha of 0.05, um, and we want to compare whether or not this fits. So since our p-value is greater than alpha, or excuse me, our p-value is less than alpha, that means we reject the null hypothesis, saying that, in fact, they um, do not have the same distribution. So there is a difference here. Um, this is pretty much the Wilcoxon-Mann-Whitney test. Um, hope it helped. Remember, it's all about relative position, and this is just one way of doing a, another form of hypothesis testing. So thanks for watching.